Hi everyone, this is Ed Harris at Family Equality Council. Um, we're just going to wait another minute or two to let anybody else join um, and then we'll get started. So just hold on. Hi everyone, um, thank you for joining us today. My name is Ed Harris and I'm the Chief Communications Officer for Family Equality Council, the leading national organization advocating for LGBTQ families and for those that wish to form them. Um, the Virginia LGBTQ Family Law Guide that we're talking about today is the latest in a series of state-by-state -state resources that we've prepared in partnership with in-state equality organizations and in-state attorneys um, and supported by funding from the Gill Foundation. In Virginia, we had the pleasure of working with Equality Virginia, um, the State Equality Federation member organization serving the LGBTQ community, and with attorney Colleen Quinn, who played a significant role in producing the final guide. I'll share a link to download the PDF version of the final guide in the chat box that you'll see on the side of your screen, um, and you'll see a link again at the end of our presentation. This webinar is also being recorded, and we'll send out a link to the recording to everyone who registered as soon as we have it online later on today. We have two presenters joining us to discuss LGBTQ family law in Virginia today. Um, first of all, Colleen Quinn. Um, Colleen is an expert in LGBT family law and assisted reproductive technology, and she works at the Adoption and Surrogacy Law Center at Locke and Quinn um, in Richmond, Virginia. Colleen was the immediate past president of the Academy of Adoption and Assisted Reproductive Tech, um, Attorneys and worked closely with Family Equality Council and Equality Virginia on the preparation of the Virginia LGBTQ Family Law Guide, for which we are very grateful. Also joining us today is Shelby Day, who is Senior Policy Counsel on our policy team at Family Equality Council. Prior to joining Family Equality, Shelby worked as a civil rights attorney focusing on LGBTQ issues, both in the private sector and at Lambda Legal and the ACLU of Florida. Uh, now I will hand over to Shelby to bring in our presentation. Thank you, Ed, and thank you everybody for joining today. So we're going to start with talking a little bit about relationship recognition. So hopefully everyone listening knows that we now have nationwide marriage equality, meaning that uh, both same and different sex couples can marry across the United States as they wish to do so. Um, like many states, Virginia had a constitutional amendment that limited marriage to, man, to a man and a woman and also had a state law that actually prohibited uh, same-sex couples from marrying. But in 2014, in a case called Bostick versus Rainey, the courts overturned the state uh, constitutional amendment and statutory prohibition. Uh, the appellate courts uh, affirmed that ruling and ultimately the U.S. Supreme Court denied review. So what that meant is that starting in October 6, 2014, Virginia had marriage equality and started issuing marriages, marriage licenses to same-sex couples. In 2015, the U.S. Supreme Court issued its ruling in Obergefell versus Hodges, and that um, meant nationwide marriage equality. So what does this mean? This means that married same-sex couples are entitled to all state and federal benefits that are attendant to marriage. We get into this a little more in the guide, but this, um, this list of rights and benefits range from um, Social Security survivor benefits um, to um, state rights and benefits, and so we would encourage you to look at that list. Um, Virginia's Constitution and Statutes um, 
still contain the same statutory language that prohibits marriage equality. They are void and un unenforceable, but they do still remain on the books. There have been three um, legislative efforts in the last three years uh, to remove the language, but those efforts have failed. And so um, that, that language in the Constitution and statutes actually still exists, um, but again, is void and unenforceable. So next, we're going to get into a uh, discussion about family formation. LGBT people and families create their families through uh, various ways. They, we certainly have diverse family structures within our community, um, and some of the ways that LGBT people create their families are um, through adoption, assisted reproductive technology or art, as you'll hear us talk about, through surrogacy, and then some same-sex couples are actually raising children who were conceived in a previous different sex relationship. Um, now I'm actually going to turn it over to Colleen to talk more about family formation. Thank you so much, Shelby and Ed. So just basically, um, without getting into too much detail, um, to do an adoption under Virginia law, um, you must be either married or single, uh, must have a home study done, must live in Virginia, or the placing mom must live in Virginia, or the baby must be born in Virginia. Um, in uh, Virginia, which is a little bit different than a lot of states, the placing mother still must give a judicial consent in court once the baby is at least three, day, three days old. A lot of states have moved to out-of-court consents, but Virginia still requires a judicial consent. The birth father can consent um, either before or after the birth, and he can either come to court or he can do it, uh, give his consent before a notary. And of course, a guardian ad litem must be appointed for the child. So those are just kind of the basic requirements of an adoption in Virginia. And of course, um, after the Bostick versus Rainey decision, um, we got the number one popular question, and that was, can we adopt together now in Virginia? And of course, the answer was yes, it's celebration time. Um, previously, same-sex couples had to only adopt as a single parent, and um, they could not adopt as a married couple. But slowly but surely, since 2006, those of us that work in this area have been working to sanitize or gender-neutralize the adoption statutes. So when marriage equality hit Virginia in October of 2014, um, our statutes were very clear that you only had to be single or married. And of course, um, since marriage recognition now occurred in Virginia since Bostick versus Rainey, that meant that married same-sex couples could adopt together. Also, under our step-parent adoption statute, um, as long as a couple was married, same-sex couples could do step-parent adoptions. So um, the only spot in the adoption statutes that is still not gender neutral that we still need to fix is where previously married couples could have done a step-parent adoption but failed to do so and divorced. Um, there's a provision that they can still do an adoption. Um, and I take the position that we can still do that for same-sex couples, um, but we're just going to uh, need to correct the statute. Birth certificates in Virginia do now say parent and parent, so we don't have awkward things like um, a, a father being listed as a mother or anything like that. So the home study in Virginia, we do not need a home study for step-parent adoptions. And even before we had marriage equality, home study agencies were writing home studies disclosing the same-sex relationship. Um, but like I said, we could only let one of the um, couple adopt, which was kind of bizarre because I would have the, uh, they would have to pick which, was, which of the couple was going to be the parent, and then I would actually have them both in the courtroom and be introducing them both as the parents, yet one could only legally be the parent. And now, of course, home studies are now written for same-sex married couples to adopt together. Um, however, Virginia's um, conscious clause um, still remains on the books. Um, and Shelby, you, was gonna, you were going to talk a little bit more about the conscious clause here. Yeah, so in 2012, um, Virginia passed this so-called conscience clause law, and what this effectively does is it allows agencies to discriminate against LGBT people based on, quote-unquote, written religious or moral convictions or policies. So what this means is that a, um, even a, a, a child welfare provider who receives state or federal funds 
can actually make placement decisions um, about a child and other decisions um, based on the sexual orientation or gender identity of the um, prospective foster adoptive parents or um, based on um, the sexual orientation or gender identity of the child in care. And these are laws that uh, Family Equality Council um, is working to um, prevent in other states and push back in states um, like Virginia. They're hugely harmful to all kids in care. We would encourage you to um, check out our website and read more about those laws and our efforts um, to defeat these laws um, and to repeal these laws. Um, but what it means for you in Virginia, since this law already exists, um, is that you need to be mindful of um, the agencies that you're using um, when you are looking to foster or adopt. And we would um, strongly encourage you to talk to a Virginia um, adoption, uh, uh, experienced um, adoption law attorney who has worked with the LGBT community and make sure you're working with um, an adoption agency or child welfare provider who is known to be LGBT friendly. And so this would be someone like Colleen or her other colleagues who work in this area of law in Virginia. Thanks, Shelby. Um, and the good news is, is that even though we have this on the books, we are rarely seeing it in practice. Um, we actually had in one of my interns survey all the adoption agencies in Virginia asking what types of families would they service, military, single, same sex, et cetera. Um, and we got very good results from, um, from that survey. Um, however, that said, I still generally direct my LGBT um, Q clients to particular agencies that I know for a very long time have been LGBTQ friendly. So um, when we are looking at the world of family building for LGBTQ families, uh, donor and surrogacy agreements become extremely prevalent. We've got all sorts of arrangements going on. We have donor egg, it can be either known or anonymous, donor sperm, either known or anonymous. Of course, we're telling folks now um, that anonymity really um, is something of the past um, that folks can't expect anonymity given the registries and uh, Ancestry.com and 23andMe and all those different things that have um, developed over time. Um, nonetheless, we still do have folks um, uh, doing anonymous arrangements. We've donated embryo, known or anonymous. Um, reciprocal IVF is when we have a genetic mom and a gestational mom. That is where one contributes her egg to the other um, to carry. And of course, we have gestational carriers. A, a gestational carrier does not contribute her own egg, um, but a traditional or a true surrogate um, actually would contribute her own egg and use either the client sperm or donor sperm. So examples of uh, LGBTQ uh, families using different arrangements. We might have a same-sex uh, male couple or an individual using a carrier or surrogate, true surrogate. We might have a same-sex female couple um, doing artificial insemination or an embryo transfer. We might have a transgender female uh, contributing um, the sperm and undergoing embryo trans, uh, formation and transfer with her partner. Or we could have a transgender male serving as a gestational carrier and carrying the pregnancy himself or with his partner. Um, and then also we could have a same-sex female couple where one plans to be um, the genetic mom and that's the, what I would refer to as the um, reciprocal IVF arrangement where one is gestational carrier and one is genetic um, mom. And that was the case with the Heyman family. Uh, they have been very forthright in allowing me, they're my clients, uh, to tell their story of their twins and were the first that were willing to um, do an order of parentage proceeding in um, Virginia where both moms, both the genetic mom and the gestational mom, are, are both declared the legal parents of the child. Um, of course, it was very critical to have a non-donor parenting agreement between them to make it very clear that the genetic mom was not a donor, but she, in fact, intended to be an equal mom. There is some debate about whether you should do an order of parentage or an adoption, um, a separate adoption instead, but the Heymans felt very strongly about them both being declared um, legal parents and not doing the step-parent adoption proceeding. Also, um, uh, there's the Timmons Olson case. Again, these are clients of mine who have been very vocal and very um, generous in sharing their story. Um, while less common, but also done, same-sex male intended partners might use a gestational carrier with a donated embryo. In the um, Timmons Olson case, unfortunately, the guys uh, faced a very activist Wisconsin judge. That's where their gestational carrier was located. Um, they were located in Virginia. 
Um, we almost had to turn it all into an adoption, but fortunately um, that activist Wisconsin judge um, who was very anti-LGBTQ um, was removed from the court and they got a really great judge after that and it all worked out in the end, but it was at great cost. And so um, in some of these areas, um, LGBTQ families are still pushing the edge of the envelope and still facing uh, discrimination out there, which we need to still be cognizant, cognizant of. Um, and in many cases, we are forum shopping and looking for LGBTQ friendly judges um, still, which is unfortunate, but it's just the reality. And then, of course, um, we even have the lesbian couple not used quite as much um, because normally one of them can carry the child, but in some instances, neither can. And so we might have an, a lesbian couple using a carrier or donated embryo. And of course, we've got the cute little cartoon here with um, the one person saying to the other, have you met my mothers, with there being three different mothers involved. So um, clinic documents that LGBTQ patients often face, and it's really important to not sign these documents um, as they are presented. Um, and basically, they, they will not um, have been gender neutralized, and so they will reference mother and father and wife um, and husband instead of parent and parent. Um, they might, uh, a, a lesbian mother who's contributing her egg as the genetic mom might be given a donor document, and a les lesbian mother gestating the child might be given a gestational carrier document. I've seen same-sex male couples um, given forms that are written for heterosexual couples, and we have lots of documents still replete with references to him and her, um, which need to be rendered gender neutral. And of course, this, um, this is really difficult for our, our LGBTQ families who already are nervous and anxious about going to fertility doctors and um, using alternative ways to build their families. Um, so we are working hard to educate the fertility clinics in Virginia and elsewhere to try to get more LGBTQ friendly, gender neutral documents in place. I mean, I've, I've modified many of these documents and keep trying to push um, for them to be gender neutral. And of course, um, I love this little cartoon here. Um, they will prevail despite non-user friendly documents. Uh, kind of reminds me of the Tim and Olson case where they had to prevail through a number of court hearings. Um, but you have the two little babies talking to each other, the one saying about the one leaving out the door, I hear he's IVF, like way wanted. And it's unfortunate but true, a lot of our LGBTQ families do have to pay much more and go through a lot more steps um, in order to family build. And again, it's important that we make sure we, we secure uh, the legality um, of their family building in addition to doing the front end documents, we wanna make sure they're protected on the back end. So um, it's really important um, in Virginia and elsewhere to have a sperm donation agreement in place or egg donation or embryo donation, but it's very, very important to have a clear written donor agreement. Um, and some folks may have heard about the turkey baster case, which is a real live case out of Roanoke, and it gives new meaning to, um, to turkey basters, especially as we get close to Thanksgiving time. Um, but basically, in this case, um, the um, intended mother um, had a male friend who agreed to uh, provide his sperm, and she used a turkey baster instrument. They had no written donor agreement in place. She thought he was a donor. Um, he anticipated having more involvement in the child's life. And so when the child was born, um, she basically um, uh, did not honor him as being a parent, and he filed uh, for visitation and to assert his rights as a father. The Roanoke Circuit Court held that a turkey baster was not an intervening medical technology under Virginia's um, statutes, and therefore the child was not conceived through artificial conception. The court went up on appeal um, the, the lower decision said you had to have a medical facility involved. The upper decision said it did not go that far. So in all of our agreements where a lesbian couple is using um, a uh, kit bought from the drugstore, an artificial insemination kit bought from the drugstore, we make it very clear that we consider that an intervening medical technology. But anyway, the main takeaway of this case is to consult an attorney and have a clearly written uh, donor agreement in place. So um, surrogacy in Virginia, as Shelby already mentioned, our statutes are still a mess in terms of being uh, technically 
not constitutional. Um, in Virginia, our art statute still does refer to intended parents only as a man and a woman married to each other. Um, the statute is unconstitutional and same-sex and single parents using carriers, uh, we simply do the arrangement outside of the statute and we rely heavily as well on our Parentage Act um, in order to ensure the legalities are all in order. And unfortunately, Shelby mentioned the legislative attempts that have been made in Virginia, none of which has been successful. Um, in addition, I was working on the Code Commission, the Virginia Code Commission, in our efforts to render the um, Virginia Code gender neutral. The efforts were moving very, very slowly, but at least we're looking positive until two weeks ago when I got word that the Code Commission had decided to table the project um, given some of the complexities in uh, trying to change the verbiage in certain areas, um, which again is unfortunate because um, that would have addressed a lot of the unconstitutionality of many of Virginia statutes as well. So in Virginia, um, same-sex couples who are using a surrogate or gestational carrier um, have to be very careful to um, ensure that their, their family preservation is intact. In Virginia, we have this wonderful form that was issued by the Department of Vital Records after the Bostic v. Rainey decision in January of 2015, and it allows a same-sex female couple at the hospital to uh, sign a form that puts both of them on the birth certificate. Um, in addition, our uh, Attorney General's office has indicated that any same-sex couple is using a surrogate or gestational carrier can use um, Virginia's administrative birth certificate amendment process um, as opposed to getting a court order. But again, the problem with our statutes is that even though our Attorney General's office and our Department of Vital Records have been very LGBT friendly, um, we don't have a basis in our Virginia statute um, for these administrative uh, proceedings to be reliable. And our art statute still refers to husband and wife. And since it is still unconstitutional, in all cases, we still want to get either an order of parentage and step parent adoption um, in order to protect the parents' names on the birth certificate since that is not enough. So I think, Shelby, so, you were going to talk a little bit, yeah. Yeah, so we, um, I know we get um, some questions um, related to family preservation, Colleen, and I'm sure that you get them as, um, as well. So I just kind of wanted to pose um, the same question in a couple of different versions so that people understand what we're talking about. Um, and I would love to hear your answer. Um, and I think it's something that's really important. So we often hear people ask, um, now that our marriage is recognized in Virginia as valid, uh, my spouse's child is my own, right? Um, or put another way, we planned our pregnancy and our child was born into our marriage or now we're married and I'm on the birth certificate, so I'm a legally recognized parent, right? Um, and so I think the underlying question here is, is, doesn't the marital presumption that exists in Virginia law apply now to married same-sex couples? And I wish I could say the answer was yes, Shelby, to all of those questions, um, but unfortunately um, not. And so until we have um, better law that makes it very clear that there's not just marriage equality, but that there is a clear marital presumption that applies to children um, that were born of the marriage or that come into the marriage. Um, we are still um, in a land of uncertainty. So yes, under Obergefell, all married couples are entitled to have their marriage recognized. Um, however, um, when we look at some of the cases that are out there, including um, the case on the screen, the ex parte EL case, which was out of the Supreme Court of Alabama, that's where we had one mom trying to invalidate the step-parent adoption by the other mom um, having moved states and challenging a Georgia step-parent adoption order um, once that mom moved to Alabama. Um, the good news in that case is that the U.S. Supreme Court held that all adoption orders must be given full faith and credit by all other states. Um, note, however, it does not apply to birth certificates. 
So um, having simply a birth certificate it does not adequately protect LGBTQ families and those same-sex couples still must have an order. And ideally, because we have this U.S. Supreme Court decision, um, an adoption order is probably the best order to have because we know it has to be given full faith and credit in all states based on this Supreme Court decision. We also have the Pavon decision that recently um, came down and in that decision it helps with the arguments toward, uh, toward a, there being a marriage presumption with regard to children and in that case um, the Arkansas Supreme Court ruled that um, although state law required the name of the mother's male spouse to appear on the birth certificate regardless of whether he was the biological dad or not um, that they would not extend that to the um, to the mother's female spouse so they would not extend it to a lesbian couple and in that case the US Supreme Court reversed the Arkansas Supreme Court in order that both moms had to be placed on the birth certificate and again this is a very helpful case but still doesn't get us all the way there um, and so, so Colleen, I'm going to, I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to interrupt and ask really oh, quick. And so, um, just to kind of recap, so what I hear you saying is, um, and I, I, just to make sure that, that I understand and that everybody understands out there. So what I hear you saying, um, and, and certainly Family Equality Council's position is that, um, post Obergefell versus, um, Hodges and so post marriage equality that, um, any married couple who has a child born into their relationship should both spouses um, should be put on the birth certificate and should be recognized as parents. But what we see happening across the country in places like um, Arkansas with the Pavan case is that's not always happening. And part of the problem there is Arkansas, like Virginia, has kept this gendered language that doesn't contemplate same-sex couples. So it continues to contemplate just different sex couples. And so we're seeing some uncertainty and problems around that, and that is also the case in Virginia. But we all agree that what Obergefell should mean and what, what states should be doing is putting both parents on the birth certificate. So that's kind of a, a recap. So it should mean all, but we're seeing problems, and so it's not um, kind of a fail-safe um, process at this point necessarily in a state like Virginia. Right, that was an excellent clarification, Shelby. And so the, the issue is, is yes, you should be both be put on the birth certificate, but even when you are both put on the birth certificate, birth certificate be aware that birth certificates can be challenged. So I love this cartoon. Um, you know, you may now kiss the Supreme Court, but I think uh, we're going to need at least one more Supreme Court decision um, in this area. Um, so uh, we'll just wait to see what comes down the pipe. So as um, Shelby kind of clarified, we have uncertainty. You can't rely on a birth certificate alone. A step-parent adoption should still take place whether the child was born during the marriage or before the marriage. And you have to think about on um, these cases that um, where a heterosexual couple um, gets, has children in existence and gets married um, and they do a step-parent adoption, it's really no different for a same-sex couple at this point um, is to go ahead and do that step-parent adoption and get that court order to secure the family. So I just kind of referenced this a little earlier, this new form for married same-sex couples um, who have children born in Virginia after um, October 6, 2014. And um, that form is great. It puts both moms on the birth certificate. But again, as we already talked about, it's just critical to do a step-parent adoption in addition to having both names on the birth certificate. And so, Shelby, you were going to talk again just a little bit just to bring home this point about why is a court order critical when we already have a birth certificate that has the names of both parents on it. Yeah, so this is something that we um, have always said along with our um, other national LGBT um, organizational um, partners that it is so important that people get um, an adoption to make sure that um, the non-biological or non-birthing parent um, is a legally recognized parent. So basically to make sure that both intended parents are recognized. A birth certificate is not enough. So it's great if both parents are listed on the birth certificate, but the birth certificate is an administrative document. It's not a court order. And only court orders 
such as an adoption order, have to be recognized throughout the United States by all states. So states have to give court orders full faith and credit, and there is no exception to that. The case law on that is very clear. Um, and so um, it really is the belt and suspenders approach. Um, there are other reasons as well beyond just recognition of, of an establishment of an actual um, parentage right. So birth certificate is a reflection of um, the, the um, family, how it exists, um, but it, is not, um, it does not itself establish a, a legal relationship. And because of that, um, or one reason for that is a birth certificate is based on the relationship between the spouses, so the fact that they're married. It's not based on the relationship between the parent and child. So we need a court order that specifically addresses the relationship between the parent and child and establishes that um, that relationship is legally recognized. Parentage solely dependent on a birth certificate can be challenged. So in the event of a divorce or a death um, of one of the parents, um, either the other um, parent or family can actually challenge um, the legal um, parent-child relationship, which we've seen in cases across the country, uh, both pre- and post-marriage equality, be hugely problematic. Um, so in addition to that, um, the um, birth certificate process itself does not ensure that the underlying sperm donor rights um, or egg donor rights are terminated by a court order. And so we want to make sure um, that that happens. Um, and, and you can really only do that through um, the court process. And of course, you know, um, evidence of that is the donor agreements um, that Kalina talked about earlier. Uh, parentage based solely on a birth certificate generally may not be sufficient to adequately give a basis for passing, um, passing um, you know, property or other rights through inheritance or by intestate laws for the child to qualify for federal benefits such as Social Security and for claiming a child um, as a dependent under pertinent tax codes. And that's because um, a, a lot of the federal laws, such as the Social Security Act and some of the tax codes, refer to parentage by um, birth or adoption um, and don't necessarily contemplate um, by marriage or, you know, statute. All the national groups, um, including Family Equality Council and our sister organizations such as, you know, the ACLU, Lambda Legal, the National Center for Lesbian Rights, and others strongly, strongly advise that um, you do an adoption to make sure that both um, parents are legally recognized, whether that's uh, through the step-parent adoption um, process or whether it's um, adopting jointly. Thanks so much, um, Shelby. So um, changing a little bit from that topic, I just wanted to briefly talk about um, guardianship versus custody orders in Virginia because across states, the term guardianship gets used very differently. And so just knowing what the terms are in Virginia is important um, to LGBTQ families. Um, first of all, custody applies to having legal or physical custody over a child under age 18. So that's um, basically having control of a child, not an adult. And of course, joint custody in Virginia can be held by two or more people. So um, while we don't have second parent adoption in Virginia, that is where an unmarried couple can adopt together, uh, we can have joint custody arrangements um, between not just uh, two people, um, but three or four people. And we've had that in situations where, for example, um, a, a woman might have had a prior heterosexual relationship and children with an ex-husband and then get remarried um, uh, to her uh, lesbian spouse. And all three of them may want to have a joint custody and visitation arrangement. Um, so that is how we address uh, those kind of multi-party uh, relationships or multi-parent uh, arrangements in Virginia. In Virginia, the term guardianship actually applies to um, individuals that are adults, that are not children. So having guardianship in Virginia over somebody means being the ability to make legal decisions and having physical custody or control over an adult. And usually that's a person under some sort of a disability. And then finally, the term guardian in Virginia is a person named in a will to either assume custody of a minor or guardianship of adults if um, a person passes away. So they would provide for their guardians in their will. 
Um, so just a little clarification on those terms in Virginia. Um, and then, of course, uh, the, there are certain social security issues that um, we need to uh, be aware of in Virginia. The Family Law Guide um, has great sections on both social security and passports. And the most critical thing to, to the base, biggest takeaway here is you need to make sure that both parents are registered with Social Security for the child and both parents get listed on the passport for the child. Um, those are the two most critical takeaways, but the Family Law Guide gives you all the links and all the information that you need to make sure that um, you can accomplish both of those things um, with regard to Social Security and passports. So Shelby, you're going to talk a little bit about name and gender changes. Yeah, so the guide um, goes a little more in depth um, and has some helpful links um, than what I'm going to do today. But um, essentially, we just wanted to, to let you know that Virginia does have a process for changing um, one's name or gender. Um, to do so, you have to submit a notarized application of change of name and a notarized petition for change of sex that includes um, a letter from a licensed medical provider stating that sex has been changed by medical procedure. So the statutes don't define what medical procedure is. So that what that means is that the medical uh, provider gets to make that determination. So you just need a letter from your doctor. You would file these documents at the local county or city courthouse. Um, and what you need to, to watch out for is there are local versions of the form and there are some courts actually require service on the state registrar of vital records and require a hearing on the matter. So there is some difference that we're seeing within the state from court to court, um, but essentially those are the, the documents that you need. You also can change your uh, name and gender marker um, on your driver's license. To do so, you um, must provide either a court order certified, certifying your name and gender change or a form signed by a licensed medical provider. Um, there also is a process in Virginia for um, changing name and gender marker on your birth certificate, and we talk a little bit about that um, in the law guide as well. So the process still can require consulting with an attorney. Um, in many states, they, you know, um, you you can technically do it on your own and represent yourself, um, but navigating that system um, is sometimes easier in some places than others. So you may still need um, to consult with an attorney, and, and Colleen may have a little bit to add to that. I'm not sure. Yeah, no, just um, thank you, Shelby, for that great overview. Um, so unfortunately, these proceedings are supposed to be very simple and uh, not require an attorney, but um, our uh, attorney general's office sent a letter some point earlier this year um, advising our courts that we had to serve the state registrar um, of vital statistics in any cases involving birth certificate amendments and some of the courts are following that letter and some of the courts are not and trying to we're still trying to get a handle specifically on which courts are and which courts are not but for the courts that are it's throwing a real hiccup into things I actually have a letter going out this week to Mark Caring explaining to him what this is doing especially in terms of driving up costs um, driving up uh, court time driving up uh, making the process that's supposed to be very simple much more complicated and in fact it, it, the re end result is that it's discriminatory because it's um, it, it's basically causing um, folks to have to use attorneys where they otherwise wouldn't have to so again um, as with many other things in Virginia we're still fighting on a number of different fronts and this is uh, an another one of them where we're still trying to get this rectified so um, I think at this point we are going to shift gears again and then talk a little bit about um, estate planning. And as uh, with heterosexual couples, all same-sex couples should have the same documents in place to uh, protect each other and protect their family. And of course, that would be the advanced medical directive, also sometimes called a living will, um, a general durable power of attorney, a burial designation, a will or a pour-over will with a trust, um, and of course that will would have guardianship and trustee provisions and of course we want to have jointly titled real estate vehicles and accounts um, and then with regard to to hospital recognition I think Shelby you were gonna um, 
ask a few questions about that. Yeah, so um, I just wanted to make sure that you covered what do, do couples really need to know uh, with hospital re uh, recognition, and does it make a difference whether you're married versus unmarried, because this is a place where we hear um, that when people are in the midst of a crisis or at their most vulnerable state in the hospital, um, that sometimes folks um, have uh, difficulty with being able to be with their partner or their spouse um, the way that they should be able to uh, in the time of need. Yes, that's, and so this is really another um, critical area. If a couple is not married in Virginia, then it becomes all the more essential for them to have this advanced medical directive and living will in place because hospitals do not have any obligation to recognize an, a spouse, excuse me, a partner who is not um, uh, married. So our hospitals and our medical providers do have a duty now in Virginia to recognize um, same-sex couples where they are married um, but just like heterosexual couples who are not married, they are not required to turn to that um, boyfriend, girlfriend, or partner um, in situations uh, that require making medical decisions. So um, we also still advise that even, even in married situations, it's still critical to know exactly what your spouse's um, desires are and the best way to do that is with an advanced medical directive and a living will with the organ tissue designation. So what the advanced medical directive slash living will does is basically if one person's incapacitated due to an accident or an illness or undergoing a, a medical procedure, it allows you to designate in advance who's going to make the medical decisions, um, who's your backup going to be, because what happens if um, both spouses are in a car crash together and one is in, and they're incapable of making decisions for each other. So who will the backups be? And also, um, what are the desires? Um, at what point would you no longer want to be kept artificially alive? Uh, would you want your organs or tissues donated to others or used for research? And now the really nice thing in Virginia is that any advanced medical directives can now be registered on our Virginia registry. So if you don't have the document on you, at least the medical providers know to look on the registry to see if there is an advanced medical directive on file. So that's um, been a great development. The other thing is having a burial designation. Um, this can either be included in the living will or done as a separate document, but Virginia does have a specific statute on it that allows um, one spouse to designate their other spouse as the person to uh, make all their life end decisions and also uh, spell out any specific plans um, I had two guys who actually it was really funny, um, just in the way of telling the story. Um, one of them, one, they, one of them was a rabbi, and the other one was a minister. And um, it was really cute. One wanted to be buried in the suit, and the other one wanted to be buried in his jeans and barefoot. On um, the one suit, of course, was going to have his full um, suit and tie and uh, dress shoes on. Um, and it was just really funny the the uh, juxtaposition of the two. Um, in terms of what they put into their um, burial designations. All right, so the general power of attorney, um, this is a document where you appoint an individual or several individuals in order of priority, or you can have co-individuals um, handle the financial, legal, and general business affairs in the event of any incapacity. A lot of military personnel really understand the utility of a general power of attorney when they're deployed. Um, but this, again, is a, a document that everybody should have in order to um, really put their house in order. And then we just mentioned uh, before the simple will or pour over will with a revocable trust or revocable trust. I'll just go into just a little bit more detail on what that is. Um, of course, a will is where you specifically can designate any guardian. And if you have children, it becomes essential to have a will. Um, and this is also extremely important in those situations where same-sex couples um, are not married or have not um, gotten an adoption order, or not legitimized um, their relationship, um, and or, or legitimized the the parental relationship with the children. In in those situations, if um, if the the parent of that child should pass and not have designated their unmarried partner as the guardian, um, that's where we 
see having um, disputes over the custody of the child. So it becomes ex especially critical with unmarried same-sex couples. Um, but again, in order to ensure that everything is orderly and as you want it to be, even with married couples, you want to have a will in place where you specifically designate guardians. Again, that's critical too if both spouses are in a car crash. Um, who's going to be responsible, um, who's going to step up to the plate to be the guardian for the children, and also who's going to be the trustee to manage um, any funds left um, for them. And so the good thing about the estate planning process is it forces folks to take an inventory of their assets, um, including digital assets like PayPal. Um, I know it's a pain in the rear end when I give my questionnaires to my clients and tell them, I know you've got to pull all this information together, you've got to pull together all the passcodes, all of your assets, all of your liabilities, um, but it, it really helps to get an overall inventory and then put in place an instruction system. If anybody's ever had to manage an estate or handle something after a parent has passed who has not left their house in order, um, they know exactly what I'm talking about in terms of um, knowing what a mess it can be. The nice thing too about um, a will or pour over will is you can designate specific tangible property to go to certain people. I can like say that I want this pearl necklace to go to this niece and that pearl necklace to go to that niece um, and uh, basically designate certain artwork and jewelry and special items. And then of course um, with the pour over will into a trust you can avoid the court supervised probate process and again that helps whoever is being left behind to sort things out, makes it a lot easier. Um, and again while state laws provide some guidance about who can inherit, those laws often leave out domestic partners and stepchildren um, and other family members. So making sure that um, your wishes are as you want them to be um, are all put into order. This is another critical document to have. And Colleen, and then, can I just add something to that? Um, yeah. From a so from a um, kind of non-legal but just practical aspect, what it also does to have your estate planning um, spelled out. Um, you know, it really makes it easier for those who you want things going to. And, you know, people, um, things happen, I think, with divorce and death where uh, people um, have a tendency to sometimes, not always, but sometimes the worst of people come out or, you know, different people have ideas of what they're entitled to or what they would like. And so the more specific you are in your state plan, estate planning um, and the more you set out your intentions, the really the easier it is for everybody who you're leaving behind because there the less room for um, guesswork um, or people trying to make decisions about things. Um, I think it's the easier it is for everybody. So all the way around, it really um, is hugely beneficial to your to your family um, and whoever you're leaving behind. Absolutely. Thanks again for clarifying, Shelby. Because just by way of example, um, if where you have two moms um, who both are involved in a car crash and pass and they have not coordinated to designate who who is going to be the first choice of guardians for the child. That's where we see the in-laws fighting over the children um, because it hasn't all been mapped out in advance and nor do we know who the two moms would have preferred. And it's tough when, I, when we do estate planning because asking those two moms who are you going to pick, um, which, you know, which in-laws can be difficult, but at least they figure it out in advance and then advise the in-laws that certain in-laws may take, are going to take priority over others and a lot of times it's because they're younger or there are other factors, um, they have more time available, whatever that might be, but planning it out in advance makes it so, so much better than leaving a mess and possible um, custody litigation um, by the family afterwards. So thank you for driving that point home. And um, just like we want to do um, estate planning um, for um, any other type of property, of course, in Virginia, sperm, egg, and embryos are considered property. And of course, we want to address the ownership of that property, uh, both while the um, owners are alive and then also um, if they pass. We are starting to see across the nation and in Virginia more and more couples arguing over ownership. We have a recent case out of Hanover. Um, where a couple is divorcing and fighting over their embryos that will probably go up to our Supreme Court in Virginia. And um, I also had an, a case in Virginia where 
one lesbian partner who contributed her egg um, to the formation of the embryos, um, wants to implant the embryos into herself, but the but her ex jointly purchased the sperm with her and is co-owner of the sperm, which makes her co-owner of the embryos. So that makes it very messy, and we want to make sure that we address the ownership of sperm, egg, and embryos that are in storage, um, both if the parties split up or if they pass and uh, they need to have it addressed in their estate documents and in the clinic documents. So we want to make sure we have prenups or postnups or other property disposition agreements and not just a clinic document. And ideally it's best to keep egg and sperm separate if that one um, woman who had contributed her eggs uh, to the embryo created with the jointly owned sperm had just kept her eggs separate then she would have been able to purchase sperm on her own and form new embryos. Um, but now she is unfortunately not able to use those embryos at all because her ex-partner will not release her ownership interest in the sperm. So these can be really thorny situations and if we dress the ownership on the front end then we don't run into um, messy situations on the back end. So Shelby, you were going to take it from here. Yeah, so, and, and Colleen, feel free to, to jump in um, in any part of this. So we wanted to give, we just have a little time left, but we wanted to give a quick overview of some of the other important um, topics that were addressed in the guide. Um, we're not going to be able to get to all of those, but a few that I wanted to at least provide an overview on um, were some of the non-discrimination protections, both on a, a state and federal level. And unfortunately, uh, in both the federal realm and in Virginia, it's more a lack of um, express or explicit um, protections for LGBT people. But I want um, folks to be aware of, of what laws do exist and, and where your rights are. So there is no express state or federal non-discrimination protections um, based on sexual orientation or gender identity explicitly in employment, housing, or public accommodations. So um, there are, um, just to clarify, there are some federal laws such as Title VII in the employment context uh, for private employment where in certain circumstances Title VII may cover discrimination against um, LGBT people, but it really depends on at this juncture where you live and uh, the specifics about your claim and whether it was based on um, gender nonconformity um, or, or sex rather than explicitly based on sexual orientation. And so the law is kind of all over the place, but there are some protections there. There also are some federal rules related to housing that provide um, some protections. In Virginia, um, some localities have actually um, enacted non-discrimination protection, so it's really important for you to know um, what your um, county and city um, ordinances say about non-discrimination, because some of them um, in, in some of the places in Virginia actually expressly include protections for LGBT people. Um, and then two important executive orders that I wanted to point out, there was a 2014 executive order that the governor issued um, shortly after getting into office that prohibits discrimination against LGBTQ state employees. So that's important to know about. And then in 2017, um, there was an executive order um, that was issued in the public accommodations realm that actually prohibits executive branch employees from discriminating against LGBTQ people in the provision of public services. Um, in the realm of employment, it's also important to know what your um, company policy said, because some companies um, actually have um, explicit policies and protections. I think an increasing number of companies have um, policies and protections um, that prohibit discrimination um, based on sexual orientation or gender identity. So um, know the policies at work as well. And again, there's a lot more um, information uh, in the guide that really breaks out employment, housing, and public accommodation and talks a little more um, about state and federal law in those realms. Um, but I just wanted to provide you an overview. So moving on to school policies and anti-bullying laws, um, there is no uh, state or federal um, protections that expressly prohibit um, or ex yeah, expressly prohibit discrimination um, or bullying based on sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, 
there are some local and school board non-discrimination protections that explicitly include LGBT uh, students and employees. And currently about 25% of public school students um, and employees now are living in uh, within jurisdictions that have those kinds of fully inclusive non-discrimination um, uh, ordinances. All schools in Virginia, um, all school districts are required to implement um, anti-bullying policies and procedures. Um, those, however, are um, uh, is a general mandate that does not um, expressly require um, schools to um, explicitly pro, uh, prohibit bullying based on um, sexual orientation or gender identity, but these kind of general policy should include discrimination against all students, including LGBT students. Um, so again, know your local um, school district um, non-discrimination laws and anti-bullying policies. On a federal level, Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972 provides some protections for um, LGBT, for the LGBT community. That law prohibits discrimination um, on a, based on a student's um, sex or gender, and that's in the public school realm or schools that are, are receiving federal funding. Um, in 2016, um, under the Obama administration, um, the Department of Justice and Department of Education had issued guidance that explicitly stated that transgender students are protected from discrimination um, under Title IX. Um, unfortunately, earlier this year under the Trump administration, uh, the Department of Justice and the Department of Education rescinded um, that guidance. But the important takeaway here is that the underlying laws that that guidance was based on um, have not changed. And we've actually seen one uh, very important um, uh, federal court uh, decision post rescindance of the guidance that really drove that home and reinforced that transgender students are protected from discrimination under Title IX. There's a case that's actually working its way back through the courts in uh, Virginia um, that uh, poses that same um, issue to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. And so that's a case that uh, you may be hearing more about. Um, that's Gavin Grimm's case. He's represented by the ACLU. Um, next, moving on really quickly to hate crimes. Um, um, there are no state protections in Virginia that, um, for hate crimes that expressly include sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, there is an insulting word statute that Colleen may want to talk a little more um, about that could apply in some circumstances. And I, I know that she has um, uh, uh, spoken with clients about uh, using that in certain, certain circumstances. Um, but first, um, one important federal law that you need to uh, be aware of is the Matthew Shepard James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act, which um, expands federal hate crimes, crimes to LGBT people. So there actually are federal hate crimes protections. We talked a little more about that in the guide. Um, and Colleen, um, do you want to add anything about hate crimes or the Insulting Words yeah. Act or, or any of the non-discrimination protections there in Virginia? The, 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 the non-discrimination protections we have in Virginia. <laughs> right, right, the lack of the lack thereof. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, as you know, we were talking um, before we got on the webinar, um, in the, uh, the Colorado case involving the Masterpiece Cake Shop, there at least is a Colorado state law um, that has some teeth to it uh, with regard to um, discrimination by um, businesses that hold themselves out to the public and we just don't have anything like that in Virginia so when I'm called with questions about what protections there are there very there really are no protections other than this little statute we have that's called the insulting word statute which sounds kind of strange um, but it basically is intended to prevent um, a, a breach of the peace or uh, or basically uh, raising, um, uh, making threats or anything like that that raises um, an, an arrangement or, or raises a relationship to the level of inciting violence. So I'm paraphrasing the statute, but it's um, a very little known statute and probably the only thing we really have um, that folks can hang their hats on. So I recently recommended it to a, a transgender um, woman uh, who called me about being uh, refused service by 
an automotive repair shop and um, it was really the only thing that I could give her to hang her hat on, um, but at least it was enough and it fit the situation enough that she could file a warrant and debt in general district court if she wanted to, um, especially to raise awareness of the issue, if, no, if nothing more. Um, but again, as I mentioned before, we have a long ways to go in Virginia in a lot of areas and this remains uh, one of them. Um, just to get something like Colorado has in place uh, will probably take some time and effort. So, um, Shelby, I think we've Great. we've we've accomplished our objective and done it in good time. I think so. Um, so, as I said a, a few minutes ago, we um, the guide itself does cover all of these topics and more um, more in depth than we were able to in a, a one hour webinar. Um, so, we would encourage you to download uh, the guide and take a look at that. Um. All right. Thank you, Shelby and Colleen, for sharing all of your expertise with us today. Um, as Shelby said, the link to the to download a copy of the guide in PDF format is on your screen right now, and you can also find more information about all of the issues that we've covered today at our website, familyequality.org. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Shelby. Thank you. Thanks, Colleen.